want to let you know what you're in for. We'll send a couple of these down this side, Ralph. Send a couple of these down this side, Tracy. This is what is sometimes referred to as a syllabus, which is a rough outline of what we're going to cover over the course of tonight and the additional five weeks, total of six weeks. Give you an idea of what the topics will be. It will also then um, help you if, you if you know that you're going to miss a, a certain week, uh, you know what the material would be. What I will try to do is, I'm, I'll tell you what I'm not going to try to do. I'm not going to try to track anybody down and say, oh, you missed this, okay? But I will have the extra copies of the material from the week you missed. I will keep them every week. So if you come in the following week and say, I wasn't here last week, can I have the material? I will have the material. So you won't have to uh, worry about missing out on something big. Uh, so topics tonight then would include what is biblical counseling, preconditions in biblical counseling, and foundations of discipleship. I'm going to use some different materials. Uh, some are from Christian Counseling Foundations, uh, materials called Helping Others Change. And I don't know what the, where I got the other stuff from. <laughs> but uh, if I, do, I would give credit where credit is due, but found a good biblical counseling manual, copy some stuff out of that. So let's start with this. I'm going to walk around and hand these out because they're, they're already pre-collated. This is the first thing we're going to talk about tonight. If you're going to, if you don't mind, sorry, let's just walk around. You see how I can crisscross and all that? It'll help make sure everybody gets a copy of that. For some reason, I didn't hit the staple button on the copier, so they came out and I had to do that with them. So the first thing that we really need to do, if we're going to talk about taking a biblical counseling course, is establish... What is biblical counseling and uh, what isn't it? So let's start with what it isn't. You're not here in six weeks to take a class that will set you up with any type of credential, any type of licensing. You're not going to be having a little office like Donna Friend and having people come to you and, and that type of thing. Now, people are going to come to you, but I'm just saying it's not... What we're doing here is giving you an overview of what biblical counseling is uh, and maybe some ability, you know, I would hope, to, to do biblical-based counseling, but not in a professional capacity. Uh, Terry, did, were there extras left over? Good. Okay, I'll save them in case anybody coming in next week or something. All right, so to start with, we have two words here that make up the definition of what we're trying to learn about. One is counseling, and the other is biblical. And that, putting them together, makes all the difference. So what is counseling? You know, counseling in, in the generic sense is giving advice, giving direction, giving an opinion to somebody. They, they want to know what do you think before they make a decision. Now, if you look up counseling in Webster's, it says this, interestingly enough, professional guidance of the individual using psychological methods. Okay, that's how Webster's defines counseling. Okay, but we're not talking about counseling in a generic sense. Okay, so one thing I, I want to bring out here is the only source of wisdom that we want to share with people is from the Bible. Okay? and I, I use for comparison purposes. If somebody comes to you and has a situation, you say, you know, I was watching Dr. Phil the other day, and he was talking about, that is counseling. It's just not biblical counseling. And I'm not saying that you can't occasionally get some good truth from all kinds of sources, but just understand that what we're talking about here is biblical counseling. So what is the definition of biblical counseling? Okay, you got it right here on your paper in italics. Biblical counseling is the opportunity to speak into someone's life using God's wisdom, not the world's wisdom, not your own wisdom. And in uh, Colossians 3.16, Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So it's the word of Christ that's in us that we can use to teach. And of course, that word admonish is to challenge somebody, to, to point out to them maybe they're going in the wrong direction and to help them get on, uh, back on track, okay? So why is there a, a biblical call in our lives for counseling? In other words, even if we're not going to be the next Donna friend, uh, uh, why is there a biblical call on our lives to be able to counsel people? Or I guess the best way I can put it to you is this. Whether you want to be a biblical counselor or not, you are going to counsel people. Unless you live in a cave somewhere, somebody's going to come to you and ask you, what do you think about this? Whether it's a family member, whether it's a co-worker, whether it's somebody at church. You're going to be asked to give people counsel. So what we're trying to do here is to say, well then why not give them biblical counsel? And there is a mandate in a sense, a call on our lives as Christians to give biblical counsel. Okay, so we have a, just an array of scriptures here uh, on this first page that tell us that we have to love others, we have to honor others, we have to be devoted to others, we have to take care of each other, we have to be patient with one another, we have to build one another up. So that's the challenge of what we're doing. We are called, in, in essence, uh, according to 2 Corinthians, if you turn that second page, to be ambassadors for Christ. Okay? So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says Christ's love compels us Christ's love compels us to become ambassadors. And he says, we therefore, as Christ's ambassadors, down in verse 20, are making an appeal to you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So he's saying that he is an ambassador. Those who are with him ambassadors, they're calling others to be reconciled to God so that they too can be ambassadors. So what is an ambassador? In essence, that's what we're becoming. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is somebody who represents someone or something. So ambassadors work out of places in foreign countries. They are called embassies. So our nation has embassies in almost every country in the world, except for some countries that we are not on good terms with. I don't think we have an embassy in North Korea presently, okay? I don't know that we have one in Iran. We may, we may not. But... There are few countries, but other than those, we have embassies. Why? Because we want to be represented in all the countries of the world. In the same way, God wants his kingdom to be represented all throughout the world. He wants people to be serving him as his ambassadors wherever they are. So wherever you work, you're the ambassador of Christ in that workplace. You may be, if, if there are very few saved people in your family, you may be the ambassador for Christ in your family. So the ambassador represents three things. The message of the king, the methods of the king, and the character of the king. Okay, so that's what we're responsible for. It's not, the message of the king is not, what do I think about the situation the person's bringing to me? Okay, what, 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 first of all, we have to acknowledge we're all human beings. So most human beings want other people to like them. So one of the things we have to kind of battle against if we're going to do biblical counseling is that what I might tell somebody as a biblical truth might not be as much what they want to hear as some worldly advice I could give them that they could go away saying what a great guy I am. But I don't have that option if I'm an ambassador for Christ. Because my message, the, the ambassador to our country over in France, when somebody comes to him about something, doesn't say, well, I think this or I think this. He says, my nation says this. That's who they're there to represent. Hello, ladies. Hello. Welcome aboard. There are two sets of papers there. Pastor Josh will get them to you, okay? Two sets of papers. And then just grab any seat that's free. So the message of the king is important. This is, the, this is a tricky piece of the puzzle. When somebody comes to you and you realize you're being put in a position of, of an ambassador for Christ, you're being put in a position of a Christian counselor, biblical counselor, you've got to make a decision. Am I going to give them 
advice that might be palatable to them, might make them feel good about themselves and about me, or am I going to stick to whatever the Bible says, regardless of whether they like what it says? That's the message of the king. The other thing is the methods of the king. Okay? So, one of the things we're going to realize is the Bible was never intended to be used as a sledgehammer. Okay? So, when we, even when we're bringing biblical truth to people, even when we're telling them things that might be hard for them to hear, the Bible gives a specific mandate. We're to speak the truth how? In love. In love. Okay? So it's not just the message of the king, it's the methods of the king. What is his way of presenting it? There's different techniques, different approaches to bring biblical truth to people that will help them be able to receive it better. The final thing, of course, is the character of the king. We represent Christ in how we interact with people, the love that we show them, the faithfulness that we show them, the compassion that we show them. So those are the three things about our ambassadorship, okay? All right, what is the relevance for everyday life? In other words, is biblical counseling just some archaic, outdated thing that what might have been good back in Bible times, but has nothing to do with today's world. Is, is the Bible relevant for today? Because it is indeed. Thank you. It was a rhetorical question, but thank you. Um, biblical counseling is good for every situation. That's what the Bible tells us, that, that, that the word is good for all kinds of things. It's good for teaching. It's good for reproach. It's, it's not just for crisis. It's not just for emergencies. Here's the thing, and we're going we're gonna to really press into this. Flip to the third page here. This is really the crucial piece of why biblical counseling matters. Because every single person has a heart. And I'm not talking about the, the part that pumps blood. It's interesting that we use two different, we use that word for two different things. One being a physical thing in our circulatory system. The other one being the seat of our emotions and our our will and all of our feelings, the heart. But we also know that not everybody has a heart, but the Bible tells us something about the heart. What's it tell us about the heart? Wicked and deceitful. It's deceitful and wicked. And it, even, it says that who can know it? So people not only, and this is, by the way, anytime I say people, that means all of us, not just the person coming to you for counseling, but you, who is trying to give them biblical counseling, have a heart that unregenerated, untouched by Christ, is deceitful, wicked, and you don't even know your own motives. So that's the problem. That's why biblical counseling is relevant and will always remain relevant. As long as there are people with wicked and deceitful hearts, there's going to be a need to bring those hearts into line with God's will and God's ways. And in doing so, in, in essence, what happens, the whole process really comes down to this. It comes down to engaging with another human being and taking the Bible as a mirror for their life and looking at the mirror and saying, what do you see when you look at yourself in this? Do you see that you, whether your life and the choices you're talking about making or the choices you have made, do you see that they line up with this? Or are you out of balance with this? In fact, maybe another way of putting it isn't just a mirror. It's kind of more like this. Um, it's kind of more like a silhouette of, of Christ. And we're trying to line up with that silhouette and see if our image matches his image. Because that's God's desire, is to conform us to the image of Christ. Okay? I don't think any of us are there yet. But we're working on it, and probably, depending on how long you've been a Christian, your image today conforms more to that silhouette of Christ than it used to a year ago, ten years ago, however long you've been a believer. And hopefully, if you're continuing to press in, it's going to look more and more like that silhouette of Christ in, in the days ahead. So that's one good thing to understand, that you yourself and the person who's coming to you for counsel need to do that same thing continually compare yourself to the silhouette of Christ so 
as a counselor, as the, as the person who somebody's coming to for counsel, before you even speak a word to them, check yourself. You know, check your, check your heart, check your motives. You know, how much do you care that this person's going to like you so you have to give them advice that they'll go away still liking you, <laughs> maybe more than they did when they came in. That's what you have to do first. That's what we as the person that they're coming to has to do first. Then the process involves saying, listen, this is one of the best things you can do as a, as a biblical counselor is identify the fact that you and the person coming to you are in the same boat. This is what I have to deal with. I don't know about you, but this is what I do to help myself get, my, get through life, whatever area that is. Yep. I take the Bible, I take the image of Christ and I compare myself to it. If you want to, I can help you do that too and maybe that will give you some direction out of this. And in essence, I would almost say this to you, you have to kind of take a line that that's all you can do. That's all you can do. One reason why is because that's all you can do. <laughs> And, and, and the other reason why is because if you offer any other alternatives, they may pick alternative B rather than be conformed to the image of Christ. They may be like, ah, I don't know that Bible stuff. Okay, well, that's all I do. That's all I can do. I don't have any other plan B. And the thing that's interesting about it is, I know this is being taped, and I know it's uh, going to be out there for people to see, but sh she knows the story. So um, my sister, who lives out in Colorado, uh, before she was born again, uh, I tried to talk to her about the Lord, and she wasn't interested, to be honest with you. You know, as many people, and you probably found that with family members, you know. She was going through a tough time in her life. This is going back a while now, and she called me up. And um, when I got on the phone with her, she told me what was going on. It was definitely a difficult situation. And I felt like I didn't have any... I can't believe you get any service in here. <laughs> uh, I, told, I, told her, I told myself I, I was like at a quandary because I thought, I don't have anything else to tell her except about Christ, and I know she doesn't want to hear about Christ. That was a little bit of a quandary. And I'm her older brother, and she was really crying out to me for help. And I said, let me call you back. Because I had to buy some time. And so we got off the phone. And I just sat there and prayed. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do because the only thing I know to offer is you and she doesn't want you. And he said, well, offer me anyway. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> so I called her back up and I said, I know this is probably what you expected to hear, but I don't know what else to tell you. None of your life is going to make any sense until you put Christ at the center of your life. That's all that I can tell you because that's what I've lived. My life prior to knowing Christ was a mess, didn't make sense. I went through all kinds of struggles. And I'm not saying that all your struggles are going to go away. As Pastor Josh said on Sunday, you might have more struggles after becoming a Christian. But life will at least make sense from the standpoint of you'll have somebody to hold on to in the midst of the struggles and talk a little bit. And then there was just silence for a little bit. And I thought, well, that didn't go over well. And then she said... I, I knew that's what you were going to say. And she said, that's why I called you. Yeah, so she said, I just needed to hear that one more time because i had been thinking about that, but I need to hear you talk about it again. And she accepted Christ. And, you know, her life now, I believe, is much, much better than it was back in those days, as is my life and I'm sure your lives too from the, when you didn't know Christ to now. But what I'm saying is, as people come to us for advice, we really don't have anything else to offer except for Christ, except for biblical wisdom. So let's get that through our heads. Like, you're giving out advice. It's either going to be biblical advice or it's going to be some other nonsense that you cooked up and heard on the radio or whatever, you know what I mean? And people might love hearing that stuff. There's all kind of ear tickling, you know, the Bible talks about people wanting to have their ears tickled, or you can give them the truth. So th this, this uh, third page is talking about the, the deceitfulness of the heart, and it says that the heart is the center or the core, the inner being, who we are, and here 
it says it's an idle factory. Okay, it's cranking out idols by the moment. Idols are anything that's standing in the way or the place of God, whether it's a person, whether it's something uh, financial, whether it's a, 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 a need to feel important. There's all kinds of idols. And what do we know about idols? Look at number C. They're blinding and they're debilitating. Blinding because they keep us from knowing the truth. Debilitating because as long as we're not on God's path, our life's never going to go well. So we, one of the things we're trying to do is to get people to realize what their idols are and to get reoriented, focusing on what God really wants them to do. Proverbs 25 says, The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man or woman of understanding draws them out. Draws them out. Helps people to get in there and see what's really going on inside of them. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And any one of us on any given day can fall prey to some false belief, some idol of our mind that gets going that we think somehow makes sense, but we haven't stood in front of that silhouette of Christ and saw that it doesn't line up, right? That's why the Bible says, take every thought captive to the beings of Christ. That's probably one good way of looking at that scripture. I have a thought. I look at Christ and I think, does he think that? Would he think that? Because if he doesn't think that, it's got to go. That's, right. that's the bottom line. So that's the process of, of biblical counseling is getting people's thinking to line up with Christ's thinking. So we're trying to help people have a Christian identity. You know, how do we define ourselves? What are our, our identity competitors? Besides what God says about who we are, who else is telling us stuff about who we are? Number one, what other people think about us. The reason why this is tricky is because from the time a baby is born, it doesn't have the ability to have a self-identity. It's trying to pick up clues from the world around it like, who am I? What the heck's going on here? You know? And so it's taking clues from other people. That's natural for a baby, but there comes a point as we, we need to actually realize that's not how we're supposed to define ourselves. For a child, yes. For an adult, no. For a healthy person, no. Because other people are going to have opinions of you. That, that's something you can't do anything about. And actually, some of them are going to have an overly inflated high opinion of you, <laughs> which you might like. They just don't know you well enough. <laughs> Other people might, for real reasons or improper reasons, have a negative opinion of you that they want to cast upon you. But and ultimately, what we want to get is to a place where we, don't, we aren't influenced by what people think. We're only influenced by what God thinks. See, when I'm the ambassador for my country, I don't really care what the French ambassador thinks of me. If he doesn't like my country's policies, oh well, that's my country's policies. And you know, it's interesting because uh, at the men's meeting, you know, I was talking about the, the, uh, Matt Kamenosh, Dr. Matt Kamenosh, putting a, a scripture up on Facebook and getting a wicked response. I mean, people just, crazy stuff they say. You know, well, I don't have to believe in your God and all that false teaching in the Bible. And, and, it, and, and I, I, I've been talking to Dr. Matt about it. And the other day, somebody did it again. He put something up there. And he's, he's kind of called out to me with a, with a call, tagged me on Facebook. He said, hey, Pastor Steve, you want to weigh in here? Well, I don't want to weigh in. I don't want to weigh in against people who are talking nonsense. Because the Bible says a fool has said in his heart there is no God. And the Bible says don't answer a fool and his follow. You'll become like him. So I'm not going to answer them directly. I did answer Dr. Matt by saying, Dr. Matt, I agree with you. Jesus is the living word. Okay? All he had posted that day, I remember exactly, was John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's all he posted. And he got this harsh blast back. That's a bunch of nonsense. You can believe all the hocus pocus, that type of thing. Anyway, after I said my little thing, the guy posted again. He said, this is what he said, Jesus is a zombie. That's what he said, okay? 
Jesus is a zombie. In other words, you're believing somebody came back from the dead. You might as well believe it, be believing in a zombie. You must believe in zombies. That's the kind of thinking that's out there. And that's the kind of stuff you're going to come up against. If you decide that as a Christian, you want to be an ambassador for Christ, and you're only going to speak biblical truth, people are going to ridicule you, some of them, for that. So the first thing you have to do is decide, how are you going to be defined? Are you going to be defined by whether people criticize you for standing up for biblical truth? Or are you going to say, it really doesn't matter. I'm here to be an ambassador for Christ's truth, whether people like it or not. And Jesus forewarned us. He said, remember, if people hate you, they hated me first. So you might as well expect that. So we have to decide that. We're also trying to help other people determine what their identity is. Where are they getting their identity from? Is it some... Thing, some t old tape playing in their head that their mom used to tell them you're never going to amount to anything is it some teacher who told them you know you're stupid or whatever it was uh, jobs people it's hard in a lot of jobs you know people are trying to get you into a certain mold you know I know there's jobs where if you come in there and you do a good job people have been around there for a while say hey hey Slow down. You're making us look bad. You know, that's a reality. You know, so are you going to work hard as unto the Lord rather than unto men? Or are you going to shape yourself to make the people around you like you better? This is stuff that we have to understand, but we have to help other people understand this. This is the path toward self-understanding for us and for those who come to us. Here's the toughest one. Self-talk. Let's look at this comment. Paul Tripp, really good teacher, says this. No one is more influential in your life than you because no one talks to you more than you do. You're in an unending conversation with yourself. You are constantly involved in, any, in an un internal conversation that greatly influences thing you decide, say, and do. And, you know... Second-guessing ourselves, wondering, why is that person looking at me that way? Am I, is something wrong with what I'm wearing today? You know, do I fit in? Am I, am I significant? Do I have a place in the world? All that self-doubt, self-fear, self-condemnation. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And sometimes the people who are coming to us who are struggling with things, they're their own worst enemy. And we can help set them free of that by giving them a correct identity, learn, helping them learn who they are in Christ. That's the difference. That's really all we're trying to do. Because how does the Bible, we're on page four now, how does the Bible define our identity? Okay? So as Christians, we want Scripture to be the ultimate authority in shaping and defining our identity. Okay? We realize that identity confusion occurs when we are letting the world define us rather than God's word define us. Okay, so this is the little model that the Bible gives us about all of humanity. Okay, you, me, Adam, Eve, everybody. It's a three letter acronym that talks about the process or the path that humanity goes through and how we're trying to help people move forward, okay? CFR, creation is the C. Now the beautiful thing about creation is the Bible tells us that we are created in the image of God. We have inherent dignity and value because we're created in the image of God. Now, you talk about what ideas fight against that. What ideas in our culture fight against the biblical truth? Because we're trying to get people back to biblical truth. What idea, and it's a major idea, in our culture fights against the truth that we are created in the image of God? Darwinism. Darwinism. Evolution. Okay? So we're dealing with a mindset a pervasive mindset in our culture 
that, that a young person is brought up under that tells them you don't have any inherent value. Why, as a matter of fact, you're just a random bunch of cells that by happenstance descended over a long period of time from, because it's not bad enough that, that we're monkey's cousins, as it were. They have this shrew-looking creature, like a mole, <laughs> that they're, they're out there saying, this is really the original mammal that all of humanity came from. No, I'm serious. You know, you can find it. Go look it up. A mole! <laughs> now, if your self-worth is based upon the fact that you're just a highly developed mole, it's pretty hard to overcome that and feel like I have value in this world. Because the other thing, you, you take that as, a, as, a, as like an underpinning, like a linchpin, a definition of who I am in the eyes of the world, and then you realize this. You add that into the mix with the fact that our world is dog-eat-dog, dog, cutthroat, uh, what's called a zero-sum game. You ever hear that expression before? Okay, here's what a zero-sum game is and why it's so horrible in combination with the all you are is just a hundredth generation mole. A zero-sum game says this. There's only so big a pie in the world of importance, of value, of significance. Therefore, if you're significant, I am less significant. So I have to fight you for significance. And one way I do that is, I can be more significant if I put you down. That's a zero sum, okay? The pie has 100 slices to it, I want at least 50. So if I can get you to only have 49, then we're good. So I, if I knock you down a peg, if I can belittle you, if I can point out your faults, and now you're a little bit diminished, then I feel a little bit better. And if I'm in a situation where my only value is how the world sees me, because I don't have any inherent value, I don't have any created value, you know, I'm not the image of God, I'm just a mole, I've got to fight to have some sense of significance in the world. And we, the culture we live in accentuates that feeds that, absolutely feeds that, through a wonderful thing called advertising. Because advertising is built on the concept of telling you what you lack. Every product is to meet a lack that you have. If your breath was better, people would like you more. If your hair color was different, people would like you more. If you had this or that skill, people would like you more. So it's, it's feeding the zero-sum idea. I've got to work hard to get people to like me more, and maybe at the same time I can get them to like you less. <laughs> That's why the C is so important to biblical counseling. We've got to establish for people that their identity is based upon inherent value being created in the image of God, no matter what anybody has ever told them. That's the first starting point. If we can't get people to the C... We can't get them anywhere. Now, if, if we get people to vaguely assent to the sea, well, maybe, you know, and that can be a, quite a process. You get some intellectual people out there, uh, they can fight you tooth and nail to give up their long-held evolutionary beliefs. How do I know? Because I was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to break down that you know, holding on to what I thought was the, the proven immutable truth of uh, atheism and evolution. But when you get people to the place of understanding, that just maybe, just maybe there's a God and just maybe he created you and has a plan and a purpose for your life, then unfortunately you have to bring them to the next letter, which is the reality of why they're struggling, which is the letter F, which is the fall. So if we're created in God's image, why isn't everything hunky-dory? Why isn't everything going wonderfully for me? Because we live in a fallen world. 
and we're fallen creatures. So, you know, a lot of people are angry at God because things aren't going their way. How can I believe in a God who allows storms to destroy people, blah, 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 blah. There's all kinds of questions out there. I'm not saying they're not legitimate reasons why people think that stuff, but people get stuck on that stuff. So we want to get people to understand that it's three letters. Yes, the world and everything in it, humanity was created in God's image, but the world is now a fallen world, which results in all kinds of problems for individuals, for groups of people. However, thankfully, there's a third letter, because if it all just was about creation and fall, what a mess we have. But we have the redemption that Christ brings. That, that Christ can bring us back to our original state that we were intended to be from the day God had us as a thought in his mind. What did he want for us? And how can we become that person? Okay. So, I'm going to wrap up this little section. Pastor Josh says around 7.20 we'll take a break for 10 minutes. So let's, in the next five minutes, I want to cover two things with you, the last two things on this page. How do I help others with this? Okay. One, don't spend all your time talking about horizontal circumstances. Okay? What are horizontal circumstances? Right? Stuff between me and other people. Stuff between me and my life here on the earth. It's all here. It's all here, but it's not here, okay? So we've got to get people to recognize that the answer's, the problem's here, but the answer's not coming from here. So we have to be able to give them some adequate time to understand and express and deal with, you know, sharing what's going on here, but then try to get them up in their thinking and the way we do that is we get biblical truth and we start bringing that into conversation we bring prayer into it. we basically say well where's God in all this yeah. what would God say about this okay and the other thing is to help identify what is the authoritative or most influential uh, influence in that person's identity in other words whose voice are I listening to instead of God's And you might hear that as they talk about their horizontal circumstances, okay? If they're talking about the same person over and over again, okay? My mother, blah, 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 my mother, da, da, da. We start realizing, well, the, 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 the mother's influence is pretty strong in this person's life, okay? And in some ways, very delicately and lovingly, you may have to say, well, I don't want to disrespect your mother, but God says otherwise. Your mother may say you're a failure, God doesn't. So we've got to get their thinking off of the horizontal onto the vertical. Encourage them. Draw them to a place of thinking a new way. A way of, yeah, okay, well, your co-worker, maybe that's who they're talking about all the time. He, every day when I come in, he tells me I'm a loser. He tells me this. Well, okay, he's a person. What's God say about you? He says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He says you're the apple of his eye. So we can either believe this bozo <laughs> or we can believe the God who created the universe. What do you want to do here? That's the essence of biblical counseling. Now, the last thing on here. Don't be a bulldozer. Don't be a sounding board. There's like parameters to this. And, you know, uh, biblical counseling, any kind of counseling, but, you know, it's, it's a combination of skill and art. Like there's no specific way of doing this. Like you're not going to, in the next six weeks, I'll give you some ways of looking at talking to people, but it's not going to be like you'll have this sheet and when somebody comes in you go, okay, step one. It's more like you kind of, you, you try to approach things from a certain frame of reference and you just go with the flow and you try to be spirit led along the way, you know. Um, I, I will compare it to this. You have to have some skills before you can flow. Uh, broken string or not, you, when you go to play an instrument, everybody wants to play. Everyone wants to play songs. Everyone wants to sound good. 
But first, you have to learn where to put your fingers. And you have to do that multiple times so you can get it right. Then you can start to play. Well, it's the same thing with counseling. You know? and, and let me just say this. The process of change involves making mistakes. So if you start over the course of this course and you start saying to yourself, man, I have not been giving good biblical advice to people. It's okay. And if you take the course and the next person comes to your advice, they leave and you go, I didn't use anything that I used in that, learned in that course. It's okay. It's a process. Over time, hopefully, you can take some of these skills and start incorporating them into what you're doing. But there's always extremes to anything we do, and usually the extremes are not the ideal. So what do I mean when I say don't be a bulldozer, don't be a sounding board? A bulldozer is somebody who, remember, we're going to give them a little bit of time to talk about the horizontal. They're not going to, you know, if they're going to come over and sit down with you for a half hour, 29 minutes isn't going to be them moaning about whoever is upsetting them. Okay, that's, well, let me put it this way. That's what a sounding board is. A sounding board is you just go like Taylor did. That was good. Good sounding board stuff. What did you just say? Mm-hmm. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Wow. Man, that's tough, you know. I can see why you're upset, you know. And there's nothing wrong with a little bit of that. But if you do that for a half hour, there's nothing to be gained. They will probably like you a lot. So if your goal is to be liked, They'll come back. There are professional counselors who make their living doing that every week, over and over with people. I know, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's terrible. It accomplishes nothing. The uh, other... It's the life right out of you when you continue to have, you have somebody that's doing that over and over. Well, it, it would if your hope is to change them. Yeah, you know, so, so you can't... You gotta you gotta give people a little chance, especially if it's somebody you don't know that well. To be honest with you, you know. But if somebody you you've known for a long time, uh, you know, you can get to the point a little more quickly. But if it's somebody you're getting to know, you want them to feel that their pain is important and and they have a right to express it. But you gotta get off of it at some point and ask the questions like it says here. Well, where's God in all this? Or what would you like to change about this? Or are you willing to look at yourself? from God's perspective rather than man's perspective. You just got to shift gears for them. Okay, what's a bulldozer? A bulldozer is a person who, I'll use again, Taylor, just, um, let's just say you came in, you're having a little problem with um, Ron, okay? You know him, yeah, that's it. So, just, I want you to start out a sentence saying, I'm having a problem with Ronnie, he's really been, just go, that's no, what. I'm really having a problem. You know what your problem is, Taylor? What? Your problem is you're not going to lie about the standards, okay? <laughs> That's, 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 right. that's called a bulldozer. Okay? Yes, yes, I have the answers. Okay? But I don't have to shove them down your throat. Not a, yeah. So I, I, I have to take the time to let you express yourself a little bit and ease into, you know, it's tough. What we're asking people to do and what God's asking each of us to do is operate in a whole new way. That's what we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds. But it's kind of like this. I'll tell you this one last story because I'm running into the break time here. I'll tell you this story, okay? When I was in junior high school, I took metal shop, okay? And in metal shop, I was working on a metal lathe, which is turning a piece of metal at a very high speed. And I'm cut cutting it and cutting it, and I want to cut back the other way because it creates a, a handle called a neural. And I wanted to make this beautiful neural thing. And in the middle of the thing going at whatever zillion miles an hour, I reached up and hit reverse. Oh. And it went. <laughs> and I think every gear in there stripped. And everybody stopped. And the metal shop teacher came over, opened up the gearbox and machine, didn't look at me, just said, get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and found a seat in the corner of the classroom. My point is you can't shift gears that quickly on people either. Okay? 
they're, they're, they're living a certain way, they're thinking a certain way, we're trying to change their thinking, we're not going to do it by hitting the reverse button. We're going to do it by gently guiding them in a new direction. All right, you're on break. My question. Any questions? <laughs> in other words, from what we talked about for the first hour, is there any thoughts, comments, things that you want to get clarified before we move on? Okay. Say, yes, Terry. Uh, when you shared about your sister, and you know, we're always supposed to just come from what God says, the point is that you didn't give up and you didn't get discouraged because I've heard people say before, I'm not, I can't talk to that person because they don't want to hear about God. But you were persistent and then, you know, prayed. So the point is that, you know, you just got to continue walking in that. And, yeah, I think it would be fair to say I did get discouraged, though, in all honesty, because I didn't want to go there again. And um, I think that's just typical of us as human beings. You know, the saying is once bitten, twice shy. It's hard to go back to people who have already rejected you and the message you're bringing. Um, if I didn't love my sister so much, I don't know, you know, that I would have been able to um, press into that realm. But um, it's something we have to understand. There is a tremendous desire. I think it's a godly desire. I don't think it's idolatrous for us to want to have good relationships with other people. God made us to want to have friends and to, you know... Um, share our lives with other people. So I don't think it's bad in and of itself. It can become an idol if I want to be liked by other people more than I want to please God. Yes. Then it's a problem. And it's especially a problem if I'm trying to give biblical counsel and it's easier to give unbiblical counsel because they'll like me better. Right. So, hey Yannick, do me a favor. Tell Pastor Roger to stick to the timetable so his students are, you know. <laughs> what, what song is that? <laughs> uh, I've heard it, but. <laughs> All right, so the paper you just got, and if there's any extras, once again, hand them to Pastor Josh. And Dana, did you get the papers, Dana, from earlier? That's, okay, good. All right, this, this is the next thing we want to take a look at. Uh, it's from a different source, but it's going to cover some of the same truth, so it might be slightly redundant, but hang with me here. This is called Preconditions for Biblical Counseling. Okay? It's the essence of what is our goal, if you want to say that. What are we trying to do when people come to us and they have... A need okay so throughout the counseling session the goal is to change the counselee's focus from a false self a self of lusts and appetites to a realization of true self a self that is in union with Christ so this is accomplished by a process remember that it's a process if if you already probably know this you probably already worked with people whether you've been a great biblical counselor or not there's probably been people that you've tried to reach with certain truth and you think you're making headway, and the next time you see them, they're back to where they started. That's called reality. That's like the process of life, you know? And you just have to know that. That's just like, okay. But you have to be able to reorient with that person and say, okay, well, sounds like this is similar ground that we've already covered. But w when we were here before, how did we get out of this? Let's get back to that. Because it's not, because they're, what they're doing in essence is they're reverting back to the horizontal. Okay, they're forgetting everything about the vertical you showed them, and they're going to play a game with you. And the game is called this. Yes, but. Okay, yes, but. That won't work for me because I'm special and I'm different. Okay, and so God's plan might work for other people, but it's really not going to work for me. Okay, and we say, no, but. God's word will work for you because God is not a respecter of persons. And that was actually an interesting scripture the first time I saw it. 
because God is not a respecter of persons. I was like, he doesn't respect us? <laughs> but it simply means this, God doesn't respect one person more than another. So that means if he changed me by his word, he'll change you by his word. There's no exceptions, there's no special cases. There's just people who need God. And so we gotta get people back to that. So let's look at this difference here, okay? The false self, the true self, okay? Look under false self here. It says, all of life in the natural sphere conditions and inclines one to deal with life's experience from a horizontal perspective. Notice what it says here, self-protective and self-defensive. Why? Because we are in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you know? You know one of the saddest things about life, and I worked, Ralph and I both worked in a school system. I worked here for 25 years. How, how many years you worked there, Ralph? 30. 35 years, okay? And one of the hardest things as an adult to see is how cruel kids can be to each other. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about even from little, yeah. you know, you're fat, you're this, you're that, you know, I don't like you, you can't play with us. It's brutal. Now, if all those kids had Christ-centered identities, we wouldn't have that problem. But this is a, what kind of world? What's the F stand for? It's a fallen world. So these kids are fallen kids, and their way of interacting with each other is a fallen way, and adults too. So everybody's got this false self. It's self-protective. It's self-defensive. It's got guilt. It's got shame. It's got anger. It's got bitterness. It's got fear. It is a life devoid of the presence of God. And so everybody knows that that's not how they're supposed to feel, or it's certainly not how they want to feel, so they try to find other ways to get out of it. In other words, they become perfect customers for the advertisers of this world. They buy every product that tells them they can be happier if they would just have this, and this brand, and wear this, and look like this. And that's what, what the false self is built upon, is an understanding that if I could just, you know, I'll tell you three of the saddest words in the world that the false self lives by. Three of the saddest words in the world. As soon as. The false self lives by that motto. As soon as I get my next step in education, as soon as I get my next promotion, as soon as I get that boyfriend or that girlfriend, as soon as I get that cosmetic surgery, as soon as I buy that pair of jeans, as soon as I do that next thing, I'll finally be happy. I'll finally feel good about myself and all these problems will go away as soon as that thing comes. And it's like a dog chasing its tail. Because as soon as you get there, there's another thing that you, well, well no, that was good, but the next thing you need is actually this. And people prey on that. It's amazing how, you know, all these scams, how many people know what the Nigerian scam is? A Nigerian scam is this simple thing. You get an email and it says that the Nigerian prince or somebody like him has, you've inherited $80 billion, but all you need to do is send us the money to cover the shipping and so we can get you this money. Now, the Nigerian scam is built on the as soon as. By the way, so is the lottery. Okay? How many people here, this is good one. How many people here have ever bought, ever bought a lottery ticket? Okay? Okay. Why do you buy a lot of Because you think, as soon as I get that money, all my problems will be gone. <laughs> Everything will be fixed. I just need that money. You see? My brother used to work for casinos before he started his construction company. And then one day, and I wasn't saved when I was buying lottery tickets, but it doesn't mean that you're inherently a horrible person if you're saved and you buy them. Yeah. But the thing is, I was buying them because I felt like it would be great to have all that money, you know. And uh, one day, my brother said to me, you know, casino gambling is like dumb. Like, because these huge casinos and all the chandeliers and all the marble floors 
and all the employees are paid for by the losses of the people who come in here. But he said, their chances are better than yours. That's what he told me about buying lottery tickets. Their chances of winning are better than yours. You're just throwing your money away. Okay? But it's an as soon as game. And the Nigerian prince people love it if somebody bites. The amount they ask you to send at first isn't that much. But as soon as you send them that little bit, then they go, oh, that's great. And we're ready to ship you the money, but something came up and we need about 200 more. And once they've got that hook in you, they're going to try to reel you in because it's as soon as, just as soon as, uh, one, more, one more payment. And it, it, no, it's never going to happen. But the false self believes it. The false self is desperate for that next as soon as because it's built on such a weak foundation of being a, Dana, somebody explain this to you later, a mole, okay? A mole. I don't want to feel like a mole descendant. I want to feel special. I want to feel important. I want to feel like I have value. So if you can pitch me something that says, as soon as you just do this, you're going to be okay. I'm buying. And the whole world's buying. That's the problem. Because everybody's walking around with a false self. What is the goal of biblical counseling? What is the precondition of biblical counseling? We need to understand that a bit about people who come to us. They, it doesn't mean they're not Christians. Right? So the process uh, that we're going through as Christians is being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Is that a light switch? No. It's more like a dimmer switch. Okay? It just doesn't happen like this. I accepted Christ. My mind's renewed. Hey! <laughs> no, it's a process. Like that dimmer switch is going up a little at a time. So we shouldn't be surprised or shocked or judgmental if somebody comes to us and they profess faith in Christ, but they're still operating like false self is like all over them. It's okay. Let's just bump the dimmer, dimmer up a little bit. Let's get them a little help here. Teach them a little bit about who they really are. Because all we're trying to do here is replace a false sense of self with a true sense of self. Okay? Look what it says here under true self. All that was done to us, what we have done to others, uh-oh, the failures, the ills, the violations of our persons, the brutalities, the perversions of life, rejections, death of loved ones, tragedies, loneliness, abandonment. Jesus paid the penalty for all these sins. That's the good news. And he provided us the means to handle the tragedies of life. We do not need to deal with these violations and tragedies on our own. Christ is in us to work out our salvation daily. Now, here's an interesting thing. Underneath that statement, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. What? Scripture, Scripture references. Why? Thank you. Because this is not about that's your opinion. You know, you came to me, you have a false sense of self. I'll tell you, you're actually worth something. But I better be able to back it up. Because who am I to say you're worth something? What well, gives me the right to all of a sudden say that you have value? Is my opinion so magnificent that because I said so, you can feel good about yourself? Well, maybe, but not likely, especially, especially when you're dealing with somebody who has a hardened, false sense of self. You can't just talk them out of it. There's a tremendously funny uh, Bob Newhart video. Do you ever want to find it on YouTube, okay? How many people ever watched Bob Newhart, okay? Now, what did he play on his show? He was, this, not, not the show where he was the innkeeper, but the earlier show. He, he was a psychiatrist, psychologist, right? So in this show, on this little clip, this comedy clip, this girl comes to him and um, she sits down. And the whole thing's funny how he sets it up, but she sits down and she says she has this problem. She has these phobias and she has these fears. And so he says, okay, um, stop it. <laughs> she says, what? He says, stop it. You need to stop that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Now, is his, because he's a psychologist, is his opinion so powerful that he can just say, stop it? And she can, she'll just stop? 
Well, guess what? Neither is yours. That's why this is called biblical counseling, not Joanne counseling or Bill counseling or me counseling. Okay? You've got to have something that, that backs up what you're about to say. Now, I have wonderful news for you. These are listed by scripture and verse. That can be scary for people. You know, well, where does it say that? It's in of Second Corinthians. Well, first of all, it's okay to have something with you. If you're going to counsel somebody and you want to do a little bit of preparing, look up these scriptures. Write them out on a piece of paper. But here's the bottom line. This may shock you, but go to your Bible and you'll see it's true. Jesus himself never quoted a single Bible passage by chapter and verse. Because there were no chapters and verses. <laughs> he always said the same thing. It is written. Or have you not read? You can do the same thing. You can simply say, the Bible says. Now, what do you do when they say, where does it say that? You Google it. You go on Bible Gateway. You type in the key words. This is the modern world, people. Come on. There's a couple nice tools to have. There's a thing called a topical Bible. How many people have ever heard of a topical Bible? Yeah, I gave you one. So you, you take a topical Bible. You look up a topic that they're struggling with. Anxiety, depression, fear, whatever it is. It'll direct you all kinds of scriptures. Or a concordance. You go to the concordance, it directs you to certain scriptures that have certain key words in them. Or Bible Gateway. It's probably one of the most beautiful things ever created, and it's free. But the key is this. Let me tell you something. When people are talking to you, you've got to trust that the Holy Spirit, Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit would bring things to our remembrance. Okay, now that's a key word. That's an interesting word. Can I remember something that I've never learned? No, I can't. The Holy Spirit will bring things to my remembrance, which means if I say, Holy Spirit, help me remember that, and the Holy Spirit says, dude, you don't read your Bible. How are you supposed to remember anything? <laughs> There's nothing in there. <laughs> I'm not going to help anybody, let me tell you. So, please understand that the only way that people are going to get something from you is if you were to have it in you. You don't have to have the whole Bible memorized, and you don't have to know things by, script, uh, by chapter and verse. You do have to know the truth. You have to know what God's Word says. When you share it with somebody, and, use, and by the way, just the simple authority saying, but God says this about you, or the Bible says this about you, they may take your word for it. But if they say, where does it say that? And they may say that for one of two reasons. One, to challenge you. I don't believe it actually says that. Well, you say, well, let's look it up. Let's see what it says. It says it right here. Well, that's surprising. I didn't know it said that. Well, let's, let's lock in on that. They may, they may ask you, they're not challenging you. They're excited to hear that. When they say, where does it say that? They're not saying, I don't believe you. They're saying, I want to, I want to see it for myself. I want, if that's true, I want to lock that in. I want to tattoo it on my forehead backwards so that when I look at myself in a mirror, I can read it. That's what we want to get people excited about, the truth of God's word. So these particular scriptures here, and in this particular, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to give you out some papers from the same thing. You're going to see lots of scripture references. I asked Pastor Josh because... I didn't know, uh, and I know that Dr. Rudin grades homework from the foundational level courses. I said, now he's, that's right, Dr. Rudin has surgery, so Pastor Josh, and who else is grading them? Celeste? I grade the advanced. You grade advanced, okay. But I said to him, am I supposed to give out homework? Okay? I'm not giving you any homework. But if you want to get serious about being a better biblical counselor, look up some of these scriptures. See what the Word of God says. Because these were not randomly picked out of a hat. 
They're pertinent. They have to do with establishing a sense of true self. They, the people who wrote this are trying to get us to focus in. Being in Christ, we are new creatures, and we are to deal with life now from a biblical perspective. Listen to this. Our problem is not with Satan, not with people, not with the circumstances of our life, but our big problem lies in our relationship with God. Do we believe what he says about us, or do we believe what the world says about us? Our focus, our goal, is to change from a concern about self to a concern about God's glory that is accomplished by our godly responses to others and to life in general. Okay, this is the last piece of paperwork you're going to get tonight. Terry, yes. Well, we'll pass this down. What about the person that says, I don't believe what's in the Bible? Well, the reality is, that's where you've got to draw the line. That's what I said earlier. Um, you're not going to be able to help all people. Okay? And, and if, you're, if you're in that situation where somebody says, yeah, uh, give me some answers, but I don't want to hear about the Bible, you basically have to say, I'm not your person then. You really do, because... Uh, what else are you going to give them? And I think if you take a st in that stand and say, listen, um, all I can tell you is this, and this is probably, you know, there's different verses that for each one of us really mean a lot. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from uh, Gospel of John where there's a man born blind and um, Jesus heals him and they take him before the Sanhedrin and they ask his parents first. Well, wait a minute, was he really born blind? His parents are afraid. The Sanhedrin is a powerful group. They say, well, he's grown up now, ask him. <laughs> we don't, want to, like, don't get us in the middle of this. So they ask the guy, he says, yeah, I was always blind. Why? They say, well, this guy, this Jesus guy who healed you, healed you on a Sabbath. Therefore, he's a sinner. And the guy says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. Like, you're the experts on that. Here's what I know. I used to be blind. Now I can see. That I know. And that's the perspective I think we have to take when people come to us and they want counsel is to say, listen, I don't know about you. I'm not you. I don't live your life. Here's what I know. For me, Christ made all the difference. For me, the Bible had the answers. So that's all I have to give you. Because I don't have anything else. And if you want something else, I'm sure you can find 10 other people to give you something else. And if you're happy with that something else, that's wonderful. If you're not, come back and see me. Because I'll still be here. And the Bible will still be here. And Christ will still be here. That's our, that's our bottom line. All right? All right, last little chunk here. Foundations of biblical counseling. Self-knowledge. When born from above, the human spirit is regenerated and united with the spirit of God. This is crucial. We have an alive spirit. When we are born, I don't know if you know this or not. This is kind of a, a thing to, to get a perspective on. When we are born... On this earth, we are actually born two-thirds alive, one-third dead, according to the Bible. Every human being born on this planet is other than Adam and Eve. They were created, not born, but two-thirds alive, one-third dead. We have a physical body, born alive, comes out of our mother's womb, we're breathing, we're good to go. Along with that, we have a soul. Okay? The soul is what we refer to earlier as the heart. It's the, it's the feelings, it's the thought, it's the emotions, it's the will. All that is called the soul. Now, sometimes people confuse the soul with the spirit, but they're not the same thing. And the Word tells us that what can divide between the soul and the spirit? The Word of God can separate those two out. Let's be clear. There's this and then there's this. When we are born again, what is being born again? The spirit now comes alive. So what we're all of a sudden dealing with is we are now whole for the very first time 
in our existence. The day we receive Christ, we are now a full, fully alive person. The problem is this. At whatever age you came to know Christ, and some people come through vacation Bible school, they're children, they accept Christ early. Some people are dense and take longer, like me. So, to whatever age you are, when you come to Christ and your spirit becomes reborn, your soul has had a head start. That's the problem. In fact, your soul and your body have a little deal arranged. Okay? Your body tells your soul, I want stuff. And your soul says, cool, I'll get it for you. <laughs> right? Your body says, I want to eat. Your soul says, well, there's cookies right over there, man. Let's go get them. <laughs> so, so your body's constantly making demands, and your soul is constantly saying yes. And that creates a tremendous mess. Although they have a wonderful deal together, it's not working out very well for you in the long run because getting everything you want all the time is not a prescription for happiness. It's a prescription for misery. Disaster. So instead, all of a sudden you get born again. The one part of you that was intended to rule the other two is now alive. And it's kind of like the new sheriff in town. Right? The spirit's coming in. <laughs> taking butt, taking names. But the other two are going like, nah, not so fast here, buddy. Everything was uh, pretty good till you came along, so we kind of like it the way it is. You can just hit the pike there. So this is the problem, okay? The soul remains the same as conditioned by life experiences. So before we can advance in our spiritual life, we can advance only if we come to know ourselves as we really are. That is, as we appear before Almighty God. Okay? That's standing in that silhouette of Christ and going, I don't look anything like Him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because you've let your soul and your body have their way for so long, you are totally out of His will. Totally. And the process now is to obey your spirit that wants to bring you in line with his image. That's the process. That's what God wants. And as counselors, as a biblical counselor, all you're doing is helping people identify this process and encouraging them to participate in it. You can't change anybody. You can point out to them. You can help illuminate for them what needs to be changed, you can encourage them to make the changes. And that's about as far as it goes from a counseling standpoint. Then they're going to do whatever they dang well please. <laughs> and maybe they'll make the right choice. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll make a few bad choices and then a good one. Maybe they'll make a couple good choices and then a bad one. That's the process of life. Most of us have gone through that. Look at this thing It says deliverance. You cannot go back and reform the old man. You cannot redo what was said and done. You can't undo the past. Everybody would like to have a rewind button. We don't have one. Instead, we can look at life now from a different perspective. We can experience forgiveness. We can forgive others. We can realize that God forgives much. I love the fact that the Apostle Paul says, you know, I used to be... I mean, I'm just using this phrase, but he says, I used to be an idiot. I was running around persecuting a church. I didn't know anything. I didn't know better. And this is what he says. But God forgave me because of my ignorance. And I think when, that's a beautiful perspective. Yeah. To be able to say to people, look, you did some stuff. You didn't know any better. It's okay. You were trying to figure your life out and it wasn't making sense. So you tried to make sense of it and you didn't. That's why you're coming to Christ now, because he can make sense of it. But to get, get people to be able to look at their past, a lot of that is the process uh, when people go through inner healing. It's the process of going back, letting the Holy Spirit reveal some things, and just reframing your perspective. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't the person now that I, that I am now. I wasn't that person back then, so I did some stuff that now I look back and I regret. But I, I can't bind myself up in that regret, I have to get free of it because God has forgiven it. 
and so I can move on. The answer to healing the soul lies here, loving the Father by obeying his commands. Unresolved actions of the past are to be dealt with in the present in the spirit of repentance and reconciliation. So that's how we're dealing with the past. How are we dealing with the future moving forward? We're dealing with sanctification. Sanctification is the work of being set apart, of becoming different, allowing the spirit to take its rightful place in running who we are. So, so it says to establish this, our aim is to work with the disciple, that's the counselee, whatever you want to say, to establish a standard from which he can work out his salvation. Okay? So what are the guidelines for that standard? As we say to people, well, once again, a good catchphrase, I, I don't mean it as like a cliche, but I think a truth we can stand on is this. What has helped me is, and I'll finish that sentence, okay? What has worked for me is, or I have found out that, okay? What does that look like? Because the, these are the things we're going to say to people, okay? I have found out that loving God and obeying his commands is what works best for me, okay? Not blaming other people, not holding on to anger, but saying, God, what do you want for me from here on out? I just want to do your will. Judging self. Now, this is not a negative judging. This isn't a condemnation. There is a big difference. And we have to help people realize this between two words that sound very similar. Conviction and condemnation. Okay? There is a conviction process that we're going to take people through. And it's not a fun thing to do. Okay? Nobody likes to have their teeth drilled by the dentist. But there's decay there. It needs to be taken out. So the conviction process is identifying decayed parts of the soul and saying, that's really not, yeah, that doesn't line up with how God wants you to live. Are you ready to stop that thinking? Are you ready to change that behavior? Because at this point, it's not helping you and it doesn't line up with who God made you to be. So it's a, it's a process of allowing the Holy Spirit to take charge and to direct how we're supposed to be. This is a beautiful phrase. I'm on the, it's the second to last page that you have here, okay? It says this, second paragraph. Uh, how we respond to offenses and irritations of life reveals the spirit that is in us, okay? Or we could finish that or extend that by saying, it reveals that the Spirit is not in us. <laughs> so that's, that's going to be a, a key difference between how most people are used to talking about their problems and the struggles they're having than how we want to teach them to um, approach them. Because most people are going to come in complaining about somebody else who is treating them in a way that they don't feel like they want to be treated. In other words, they're offended. They're upset about how they're being treated. So that's the process we have to help them identify. First of all, if that, person, if that person's opinion means so much to you that you want to consider that maybe their way of talking about you is more important than what God thinks about you, then aren't you making them an idol? That's something we have to, that's conviction. Okay, it's not condemnation, it's just, could we consider possibly? You know, God says, and if God says it, we can say it, come now, let us reason together. Right? The process of counseling is, let's reason about this, let's consider this, let's look at this from some different viewpoints. I can see where that's probably hurtful for that person to talk to you that way. I understand that. But what would God want us to do about that? Because what is the next thing here that's really crucial? Forgiving and reconciling. Forgiving and reconciling. Listen. <laughs> this is a, a, what do I call it? A um, very descriptive analogy that somebody used. I think it might have come out of AA, but I, 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 I don't know where it came from. I just like it. Okay. It says holding bitterness and resentment. 
is like wetting your pants and thinking the other person is going to feel it. Okay? You ain't hurting nobody by not forgiving them. You're just hurting yourself. That's the reality. Okay? The other corollary to that is having unforgiveness and bitterness is like drinking poison and thinking the other person's going to die. It's not, you're not hurting the other person by being unforgiveness. There's a, there's a set of prayers that I pray one each day. They're from the book called uh, The Power of the Praying Husband. And they're prayers that husbands can pray for their wives. I've given them out to men at different events we've had, but uh, one of them, because I've been praying them for 20-some years, I know most of them almost verbatim, uh, one of them is about it's praying for my wife that she would not get caught up in any unforgiveness. And it uses this phrase. It says, help her to understand that forgiveness doesn't mean the other person was right. It just means she wants to be free. And that's the key here. You know, we don't have to validate that how somebody's being mistreated is acceptable. It may be totally unacceptable. The question is, do you want to be in bondage to that? Do you want to be tied to that? Do you want that to be the prevailing emotion that's with you every moment of the day? Or do you want to say, I don't want to be connected to that anymore. I want to be free of it. Then you can free yourself of it by forgiving. Just by choosing to say, I, I don't, I'm not connected to that person. I'm not connected to what they did to me. I am now choosing to release it to Christ. Because ultimately, He will judge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. So we can just free ourselves from all of that. That's a wonderful, beautiful part of a counseling process. Now, the next thing on here, daily devotions. Once again, we should be the example to people who are coming to us of people who are in the Word. Okay? Uh, Pastor Josh mentioned on Sunday, our friend Chris Fedor was talking about how the daily bread has made a difference in his life. Um, the daily bread, how can I say this without sounding too harsh? Bare minimum! Read the daily bread. Get a little snippet of Scripture. Get a Bible app on your phone. Read a scripture. You'd be surprised. Now, you're going to be surprised about this. I'm going to brag, okay? Not about my Bible app. I'm going to brag about this. Ralph? What's that little number up, up there? 213. 213. 213 days in a row, I have been on... Duolingo. You know what Duolingo is? It's a little uh, uh, phone app to teach you Spanish. 213 days after doing that. Because if you miss a day, you go back to zero. I don't like that. <laughs> but if I can dedicate myself to 213 days in a row of this little phone app to teach me a few Spanish words every day, can't we devote ourselves to the word a little bit? And once again, we need to be setting that tone with people who are coming to us because one of the things we're going to encourage them to do is some type of daily devotion. Why? Because that's what changes our lives. We've got to encourage people to get in the Word. We've got to let people know if you're in the Word, you're going to be less likely to get stuck with bad thinking because you'll be able to take your thought Compare it to what God's Word says and go, that's not right. Of course it's not right. God's Word says this and you're thinking this. So now you have a choice. Let that thought go and think godly thoughts instead. But people can't do that unless we're encouraging them to get in the Word, read the Word, know the Word, and along with devotions, what's it, what's it tie into that? Devotions and what? Meditation. Okay? Meditate on God's Word. Think about God's Word. To try to consider how does this apply to my life you know that's one thing beautiful about the daily bread I've been using daily bread for years it was one of the first things I latched on to when I became a new Christian because if you know anything about me Ralph will validate this I'm cheap and the daily bread is free <laughs> 
So what, the daily bread is beautiful because it gives you a little scripture and it gives you a story about that. And then down the bottom, it has a little prayer to take that and apply it to your own life. That's the difference between devotion and meditation. I go to devotion, I, I learn a little bit of something about God and His Word, then I go to meditation. I pray, I ask God, well, how, do, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to my situation? We have to try to help people learn how to do this. Because honestly, it's the only hope they have. Because it's the only hope we have. So this is the process of biblical counseling. Last page here. Okay, now I'm, this time I'm not going to take you over time. All right, we'll get you out of here maybe a little bit early. All right, the objective. What is the objective? We begin a life of reversals. We're reversing course, but we're not doing it like bulldozers. We're not doing it like Pastor Steve who pressed the reverse button on the metal lace while it was running full speed going forward. It's, a, it's like... Um, Amy Grant sang a song, It Takes a Little Time. Remember that song? It takes a little time. What was the punchline? To turn the Titanic around. That's, remember that song? It takes a little time sometimes to turn the Titanic around. Okay? People are headed in the wrong direction, and they've got a pretty well-worn path in that road heading that direction. And we're saying, yeah, it's not where we're, this isn't, like, you've got to go back this way. That process of turning to where we're going to where we're supposed to go it has a very specific biblical name. What is it called? Repentance. Okay? A lot of people think that repentance is, I'm sorry for what I've done. It's not the same thing. Just like the scripture tells us that God's word can separate from the soul and the spirit, all of a sudden we say, oh, they're not the same thing? No. And there's a scripture that clearly tells us that repentance isn't sorrow because it says godly sorrow works repentance. Godly sorrow brings about repentance. Will people become sorrowful in this process we're taking them through? They might. They might feel terrible about, oh my gosh, I've been living my life totally wrong. That's not your goal. To send people home upset that they've been living a horrible life. Your goal is to say, well, okay, it's all right. You're sorry about that. Let's turn. That's all God asked you to do. You know, at that moment when people are coming to that realization that their life is a mess and it's their fault, <laughs> no matter how many people they've been wanting to blame, the truth comes home and they realize, I've created my own mess. That's okay. Because that's a good time to take them to a very, very familiar, very well-known story found in Luke chapter 15 called the parable of the prodigal son. Okay? Which makes two very clear points. One, yes, he made a mess of his own life. Two, his father was waiting for him. All he had to do was turn around and go back. And so we're trying to get people in this transformational process. A life of reversal. The issues of the past are going to be dealt with in the present in a biblical manner. Daily offenses and irritations of life are going to be confronted and dealt with as directed by the Holy Spirit. Two things are going to happen simultaneously. The self, we should say this, the false self, is dethroned and God is enthroned. Okay? The stage is set for a drama of being conformed to the image of Christ by practicing loving God, judging self, not condemning self, just judging, just holding ourselves up against that silhouette of Christ. Forgiving others, reconciling, doing daily devotions, daily meditations. That's the process. And once again, for most of us, if you honestly think about it, when people come to us, is that what we're doing with them most of the time? Probably not. Probably not, or you wouldn't be sitting here in this classroom. Okay? We're trying to learn how to do this. Okay? And, and here, this will be the best thing to make you not feel bad at all, okay? Sometimes people come into my office and I'm talking and chatting and so forth. I ain't doing none of this. <laughs> I'm like totally off base with where I'm going with my conversations because I'm a person too. And sometimes I have to catch myself and go, dude, what is coming out of your mouth? I mean, it's just like, it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> it's human, that's right. That's right. 
But we, what, we're being given tools here. We're being given an opportunity here to start to become better at e affecting the world and the people around us for Christ, using this as a model, just learning to recognize, for starters, that when the person's talking to you, that's false self-talking. That's old nature talking. And it can, it, what happens is other people's false self and other people's old nature can engage your old nature. You know what I mean? Classic example of that. Somebody comes to somebody else and starts talking about their spouse. Okay? The natural response is, yeah, my wife's the same way. <laughs> That's one old self talking to another old self. Okay? That is not biblical counseling. It's not even remotely close to biblical counseling. But we have to understand that we have an old nature, an unregenerated nature. People, people coming to us have an unregenerated nature. Here's the thing, maybe the first step, very first step. That's all. Everything comes in little baby steps. So first step is to realize this. When people come to you and start a conversation, first step, recognize that every conversation is a potential opportunity for biblical counseling. That's all it is. And if you start to frame your conversations through that and start to say, well, maybe I should try to help this person from a biblical perspective with what they're bringing to me. Then you can start to look for signs. You know, what, what's, what are they conveying about false self? You know, what are the clues that they're operating outside of how God would want them to see the situation? And then, very gently, very humbly, acknowledging that None of us are any better than anybody else, and we've all made our mistakes. Maybe even say that. Listen, all I know is I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but what has helped me was to stop and think and ask myself, what will God want me to do? Do you think maybe we should do that in your situation? That's a good way to start a conversation, right? You do not have to say, would you like some biblical counseling? <laughs> You do not have to say, I took a class at PBI. <laughs> you simply have to relate to another human being from the perspective of biblical truth in contrast to worldly thinking. That's all this is. And over the next weeks, we're just going to try to get more familiar with it, get a better understanding of some of the things you might encounter and how to handle them. And I believe in the, if you look at your syllabus, in the final week we're also going to cover crisis counseling, which is a whole separate animal. Because you don't have a lot of time to think in a crisis. But you can still, that's why it's the last week. Because <laughs> if you have some of this as a background, you can still respond biblically to a crisis, no matter how tough it might be. Okay. Again, before we close, any questions or thoughts or confusion I may have created unintentionally about any of this. Have you ever had a scenario where for examples you've had to, you know, you've had an individual and it's continually they're talking about the same thing over each and every time and it comes to a point where you ask them, did you do what I suggested to do? And they tell you no. Well, then I'm asking you to do that. Then come, come back and see me. You know what I mean? It's almost yeah. like you're giving them the tools. That's a good question. And it is a little different in my role as it would be for maybe somebody coming to you because my role is a little more professional as a pastor. Well, I'm just asking. No, no, no. It's a good question. I just want to, I just want to differentiate. Yeah. Okay? I have had people who, that I've asked that exact question because they're coming back with the same scenario multiple times, and I'll say, well, look, we talked about a plan for this, and we had thought, 
that this would be the thing. We agreed, as a matter of fact, that this would be the thing you might do differently in that scenario, but it doesn't sound like you're doing it. And so I don't know what else I can say at this point. We can't really go forward until you're willing to do that thing. Uh, so I'm not sure we should even schedule another session because well, I, don't, I think we're at an impasse right now, but when you want to take that next step, that's okay. These are things I think you might need to do. Now, that's a little different to do with a friend. <laughs> you know, you don't say, I don't think we'd be friends anymore. <laughs> because no. you're like, not listen to my advice, you know yeah, what I mean? I wouldn't say that, but I've actually said to, to, you know, I'd say always constantly calling, I'm sorry, but you know what? I, I love you, I care about you, I've given you some tools, and I'm asking that you, until you do those things, Please don't call me about those same issues. And that's the key, Terry. Yeah. You know, you can say, look, we can talk about all yeah. kinds of things, yeah. but I don't think we can talk about this issue right. anymore because I don't see that you're making the changes that need to be made. And, you know, you can even say, maybe my advice isn't what you're looking for, but I don't have anything else more to give you in that regard, yes. in the context of that yeah. concern that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you have to draw that line at some point. Yeah. Unfortunately, you wish you didn't, but you probably do. Okay, now I can see Pastor Roger, that slacker, is letting his people out. So, uh, I want you all like me, so I'm going to let you out too. So let's just close in prayer. Father God, we just thank you tonight uh, for your goodness, and uh, I thank you for everyone who came here tonight and their attentiveness and uh, just the great opportunity we've had to discuss a, a new model for how we interact with people uh, that we haven't thought of in the past as, as people who are coming to us for biblical counseling, but they actually are, <laughs> whether they realize it or, or we realize it, because that's our calling as your ambassadors to bring your truth to a hurting world. And we ask you to help us over the course of these weeks to just become more proficient at doing that. And we thank you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.